Hey, before we jump into the podcast, I've got a huge announcement to make. For the first time ever, I'm gonna be holding a real estate investing workshop right here at my office in Las Vegas. I'll be given the same blueprint that we've used to fix and flip and wholesale over 100 homes the last three years straight. We'll be going over how to find good deals, raise money to buy those deals, manage contractors, build out a team, and much more. And it doesn't matter if you're trying to get your first deal or scale your business. This workshop is gonna help you get to the next level. And I'm purposely keeping it small so that we can have that intimate feel and get all your questions answered. So if you wanna jump in on the workshop, you can find it at ryanpineda.com. It'll be right there on the main page, or you can click the link below. Once again, go to ryanpineda.com or click the link below. Remember, spots are limited, so make sure you sign up quick. Now, let's jump into the episode. In today's show, we had my good friend Lucky Lopez on, who is a car flipper and dealer out here in Las Vegas. And we talked about a bunch of different things in the automotive industry. We talked about how to flip cars at the auction, a new payment model called buy here, pay here, which I think is gonna take over the car industry as time goes on. We also went over how you can buy a car and have it paid for completely by just renting it out on Turo. I think that's a really cool idea because I'm thinking about putting my own Tesla on it right now. We also talked about what my next car will be, buying my very first sports car or supercar. You'll be curious to hear what he suggests I get. And then we also went over dealer confessions, just different behind the scenes stories that he's experienced as a dealer out here in Las Vegas. You don't wanna miss out because it's pretty crazy. So let's jump into the show. Welcome to the Ryan Pineda Show. Where our mission is to invest. I only expect to make money in things that I understand. Innovate. It's about believing in the future and thinking that the future will be better than the past. And inspire. I am much more likely to hit my goal just due to putting it out there. You now rocking with the best. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Ryan Pineda Show. Today, I have a very awesome guest who I have collabed with on my main YouTube channel before. We actually snuck into the car auction together and ended up getting some cars and doing some cool things. I have none other than Lucky Lopez on the show today. How you doing, Lucky? Not too bad. Appreciate it for having me, brother. Yeah. So for those of you who have not seen that YouTube video, you need to go watch it. Um, We'll link to it down below. It's got a decent amount of views right now, about like 40,000. Oh, yeah. And I know when you search anything that has to do with car flipping, car sales, we're trending at number five to seven. I love it. And uh, that's because I'm super passionate about flipping anything, uh, whether it be couches or houses or even cars. Um, But yeah, Lucky had reached out to me a couple of months ago. He's a local car dealer, car flipper, investor here in Vegas with me. And he saw that, you know, I was doing all this stuff with Flip Nation. He's like, dude, I want to take you to the auction. I want to, uh, you know, show you the ropes of what we do in the car business. So I'm excited to go through all the different ways that, you know, you guys make money in the dealership because there's there's so many things you've told me that I'm like, wow, (laughs) I can't believe that's a thing. But uh, we'll get into that later in the episode. But before we do... Why don't you just give us a little like background of how you got here, your story? Okay. Well, just like you, I'm also a Las Vegas native. Um, graduated from El Dorado High School. Shout out to anybody's listening. Um, I, uh, my whole family were second generation here. Um, love the city, love the town. I started basically working on cars in my driveway when I was a kid. My dad had a few kind of just cars that he just kind of gave up on. I was tinkering with them. And one day I was going through the newspaper and I saw an ad on tow yard auctions. Now, I didn't know this. This was my first time, but there's every tow yard has to post something when they basically impound somebody's vehicle, notifying them that they're going to have it up for public auction. So this was when I was probably about 14. I was just like, you know what? I got a few bucks from working my summer job. You know, let me go try this. 14 years old, walk into the auction. They must have thought I was 18. <laughs> um, and then uh, just basically started bidding on cars. Brought home two cars. My parents were a little upset with me, but I just – I started fixing cars and just kind of fell in love with it. Um, it went from just kind of as a hobby through high school and ended up becoming more of a passion. How did you get the money to buy cars at 14? Um, well, during this time, you know, obviously in Vegas, it's 110 degrees, 115 degrees in the summer. Ain't nobody want to uh, mow their yard. No. And we live close to an HOA, so we knew that if they didn't mow their yards, they were going to get ticketed and fined. So we'd wait to the hottest days of the summer. Hey, 20 bucks a yard. We'll go ahead and mow your yard. So kind of same thing, day one hustling trying to make that money to, to uh, grow up in the, what it, we wanted to do was basically flipping cars. But yeah, we worked all summer, got about $1,200 together, which is enough to buy two cars from the auction. 
Wow. What were those two cars? What's selling for 600 bucks? It know? was a 1979 Lincoln Continental, and it was a 1960, I believe, 7 Chrysler Imperial. These things were land yachts. So what did you make on those first flips? Um, we purchased each of those for about three to $400. We drove them back. Um, the Chrysler Imperial, we actually kind of just took down one of the lanes. We ended up jumping it off a ditch and kind of like beating it up. We, we, <laughs> we so still, that was a loss. <laughs> yes. But no, we actually, we sold it for about 50 bucks profit, which, which I was shocked that my dad laughed, but the, uh, the Lincoln, we actually sold for a thousand bucks. So we doubled our money and it was crazy. I showed my dad and he just, he's like, Oh, well you just, you got lucky. It's, you know, it's never going to happen again. And I started doing it and it just kind of grew from there. What did your dad do? Like, why was he doubting you? Um, my dad's very old school, very traditional. He believes, you know, that you should go to college. You should, you know, get a regular job, work nine to five. And that's kind of the mentality he was, you know, very smart guy, probably one of the smartest people I know, but he has all the makings of being probably one of the, an amazing business owner, but he just doesn't have that serpent, that certain type of mentality. So when I started this, when I was younger, I just figured this is what I want to do. Let me give it a shot. Yeah. So, you know, you do it as a teenager, you know, you get out of high school. What happens next? So when I graduated from high school, I was only 17. I was pretty young, so I didn't know what to do at that time. I wanted to go to school actually for music of all things, which was hilarious. And I just want to be like the next Ricky Martin or what? Uh, no, definitely not that. Um, I just, <laughs> I just wanted to do some sort of type of music, something fun. Yeah. Uh, and at that time, if you wanted to go play sports, I was going to try to go to get a scholarship. You weren't allowed to work. So I was like, well, let me see if I can get enough money to buy a car. Right. And so I just started basically flipping more cars. Um, I rented an apartment complex. I mean, excuse me, I rented an apartment, started working on my cars there. And it all started with an apartment manager basically telling me, hey, Lucky, you can't do this here. <laughs> you can't make a big mess. You're tearing apart cars. I was going to say, yeah. if I'm at the apartment, I'm like, dude, <laughs> this guy, he's a problem. Oh, 100%. So, <laughs> you know, he was nice. He's like, look, I'm going to give you one week. So I was scouring everywhere trying to find a cheap place, and I found one at the center of Spring Mountain on Spring Mountain and Valley View. Okay. You know, this was it's back. where I grew up. Yeah, so I, this was back in, I think, 2000. I rented a tiny little warehouse in the back, and I started fixing my cars there. And it just kind of grew into a business. I started doing my friends' cars, family's cars, and then I got really bored, and I bought this Ferrari kit car kind of as a gag. I found it on, uh, well, this was back then. I don't know if you remember the Recycler. What is a kit car? I don't even know. Um, so this particular kit car was a Pontiac Friero with a Ferrari 355 body kit on it. Oh, uh, okay. So basically you cut it, you stretch it seven inches, and you put the uh, Ferrari body on it, and it looks just like a <laughs> real Ferrari. I did not know that was a thing. Okay. Yeah. So, so it's got know, like a Pontiac under the hood, everything, and it just looks like a Ferrari. Yeah. So, you know, it was the, the most baller on a budget vehicle that I could possibly get as an 18-year-old kid, you know. And at this time, I had an M3, and I was like, well, I want to get rid of this and get this because I think this would be cooler. Well, I winded up working on these cars, and somebody drove by one day in a Lamborghini Diablo. He's like, oh, my friend said that you work on exotic cars. I want to bring my vehicle in for you for service. And I was like, uh, yeah, but I, I haven't really worked on a lot of these cars before. Dropped it off. All it was was um, the cooling fans weren't cooling, and I had a few small issues, which were general mechanical, which any mechanic nowadays can figure out. But at that time, there was no Ferrari dealership in Vegas. There was no Lamborghini dealership. Mm. If you had one of those cars, you had to ship it either to L.A. or to Scottsdale. Oh, wow. So I fixed the car and gave the guy a bill, and I think it was like $300. And he's like, that's it? Is this a mistake? I <laughs> mean, like, 3000 right? Yeah, and yeah. exactly. He was like, he goes, it's not 3000 Oh, no, I got to give you. Here, here, bro, here's 1000 bucks. Thank you so much. You saved me tons of money. Yeah. And I was shocked. And at that time, I was like, well, I think I found my, my calling. I'm going to try to see if I can go work on some Highline cars. So at that time, I actually flew to New York to train with a few people that were teaching people how to work on exotic cars. And at this time, I didn't know that what they were doing was technically illegal. They were certified Ferrari mechanics teaching other people on at the Ferrari dealership how to work on these exotic cars. Oh. So, you know, we paid our fee, went in there, spent two weeks in New York, learning how to do timing belts on like 355, 360 Ferraris, um, how to do heads on like a Lamborghini Diablo, Murcielago, stuff like that. And we started learning these things, and it was great. Came back to my shop, decided I'm going to work on exotic cars. That's going to be my specialty. I'm going to do nothing but the best cars. exotic car mechanic in Vegas. That was my goal, and winded up. We opened up. Um, I didn't get my first client till about a month. I dealt with uh, Dream Car Rentals. Um, 
Shout out to Rick. Uh, he's no longer with us, but a cool guy. He started his rental car company here back in, I believe, 1995, doing high-end exotic rentals. And just kind of came at a whim, went and knocked on his door, said, hey, bro, I really would love to get your work. Let me earn your business. Let me fix one of your cars for free. Right. So to me, it sounds like you were a mechanic first and foremost. Like, what, what was making you more money? Was it being a mechanic or was it flipping, starting out? Uh, you know what? In the beginning, it was flipping was because I, I'm able to create my own business at my own pace. So I think flipping was the way to get me to there. But when I was doing the, the auto repair and customizing and having the body shop at this time, this was during, you know, 06, 07, 08, when the economy was decent and we were just making money. But as you know, what happened in 08, right, um, right. kind of brought it all. But then that's when I went back to the basics with flipping cars. Got it. Okay. So you become the, the go-to guy for, you know, luxury cars and mechanics and everything like that. Um, I mean, how does it lead to being this car flipper and dealer? Um, at that time, we were, you know, 08 crashed. Everybody lost everything. Um, at that time, I wanted to take a break from the car business. So I actually went to Texas and flipped houses for two years, which was kind of funny. I did not know that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, so we met a hard money guy there and he was just feeding us houses and I missed Vegas so much. I love the lifestyle here. I was like, I, I want to come back to Vegas. So we moved back and this was probably 2010, 2011. And all of, everyone kept asking me, Hey, do you have any cars for sale? Do you have any cars for sale? You know, um, we really need cars. And I started noticing this huge gap in the subprime market where, you know, back in the day, everybody was giving out credit. I mean, anybody can get a $60,000, $100,000 car loan, right. $100,000 credit card, a, a million dollar home with like, you know, supposedly provable income. All of a sudden, the banks changed all that. So these people that normally could get financed couldn't buy cars. So now they were like looking for cheap, affordable cars because their credit was shot. Right. And that's when I just said, you know what, let me come back to Vegas. I took about $60,000. I started buying a bunch of really cheap, affordable cars started flipping them, seeing how that was going. Did that for about two years before I actually decided to go ahead and get my dealer's license. Got it. Okay. And what year was this when this, you came back? Um, 2011, I believe. Okay. And then from there, it just became full-time dealer, flipper. Yeah. You know, we, we went really hard with the dealership. You know, in 2014, we, um, we set it up. We started with about 30 cars, blew up to 80 within six months, then within two years, we had 150 cars. Um, we were looking at probably opening multiple dealerships. We had 30, 40 lenders. Um, we were just pumping cars out. It was such a blast. Yeah. It was it was definitely good times, you know. But, uh, you know, just like right now, you know, we hit a little bit of a hiccup, and the banks keep changing these rules, and the lending for auto sales just dropped dramatically. And that's what brought me on to the next phase, which was getting into, you know, buy here, pay here, and, and building some sort of other thing where I can approve people on, you know, their income, their uh, ability to pay back instead of just their credit history. Right. Because at this time, there's still a lot of people that are good people. They just didn't have a chance to rebuild their credit yet. Right. The banks were so strict. So let's talk about that. Um, the buy, buy here, pay here is one of the cooler models, you know, when we first met, well, I was like, wow, like that makes a lot of sense, you know, in real estate, we've got creative financing and seller financing and it's very similar. Like, Hey, you know, we'll sell it to you and you pay us. We'll, we'll be the bank on it since another bank will not be it. Um, but you know, we're going to, you're going to pay a premium to do that. Not only on the purchase price, but also on the interest and everything else, but it's a way for you to get a car to kind of, kind of explain the model and how it works from like everyone's perspective. So buy here, pay here gives the dealership the opportunity to approve people that normally wouldn't be financed through traditional financing. And a lot of people back in the day used to think that buy here, pay here was a bad thing. But in our local economy, especially Vegas, there's a lot of factors that come into um, lending. Last or no, two years ago, they were um, had the Fair Credit Act where anything they consider uh, predatory lending, the government can stand in and find big banks like Wells Fargo, Bank of America. And even though there's other smaller banks, we all get our money from Wells Fargo and Bank of America. Right. So they basically put more tighter restrictions on lending, which hurt a lot of small independent dealers and franchise dealers. They couldn't do the traditional financing model. So with buy here, pay here, it gives us the option to finance people that basically couldn't get financed before. You know, everything from, let's say you're a, a 
opening up a construction company, you need a few work vehicles. Most people are going to look at your credit and say, well, your new business, we don't trust you. You know, we're not going to give you a shot, but with our buy your payer program, we can actually say, okay, well, give us a few bucks, make biweekly payments. Once we build a little bit of trust, we can either refinance it, lower the interest, or we can go to monthly payments to help, you know, make that customer a little more easier with their finances. Yeah. And I mean, I love it. It's, it's literally just like real estate creative financing. You know, if somebody has bad credit or they don't have a big enough down payment or, you know, they don't have work history, that's two years and tax returns, or maybe they run a cash business, right? So they don't yeah. show a lot on paper, especially here in Vegas, you know, like you said. Um, it's just one of those things like, well, somebody, these people can afford cars, they yes. can afford homes, It's, but they're not going to do it traditionally. So to have another option, I think it's a great thing, you know, and the person who's giving them that option needs to be compensated for, you know, providing this creative alternative. You know, typically when you do seller financing in real estate, the seller sells it for a higher price than usual. You know, they, they can get a bigger interest rate than usual. They can do these things because they're taking on more risks since you're not buying it the traditional way. Hundred percent. I mean, that's that's pretty much how we explain it to our customers is offsetting the risk because you know you're born and raised in Vegas. We get a bartender that comes in. They work three days a week, Monday. You know, I mean, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. On paper, they make maybe ten bucks an hour. But you and I both know that these guys are the making a thousand dollars a day in tips. Yep. So it's very hard to go to Wells Fargo and be like, "Look, I got a good credit score," and they look at their pay stubs and they're like, "Oh, well, you only make." hundred dollars a week. We yeah. can't give you this new Mercedes. No, no, I make I make like six or seven grand a month. I can afford this the six hundred dollar car payment, no problem. And I think that's what's kind of putting us apart. Plus, we're one of the few buy here payer. Actually, we're the only buy here payer place in Las Vegas that reports to all three credit bureaus. A lot of people think that if you do private financing, you don't get that um, basically on your credit report. Where we're the opposite. We actually do that now. Yeah. So you're actually helping them build their credit for you know the next car or house or whatever. Yeah, because my thing is, you know, like most of these people, you know, car business got a bad name. Oh, they just want to sell you a car and kick you down the road. Right. My goal is to get you into a car, sell it to you, and hopefully build a little bit of credit. You bring it back, I get you redone with the credit union, and you get the car that you really want. A lot of these people, and I'm sure you can testify this, you know, they, they don't want to start in a cheap car or a cheap house. They want to go straight to the mansion with all the features, <laughs> hardwood floors, jacuzzi yeah. tub. And it's like, no, you got to start with this condo or start with this, you know, economy car, and then we'll get you the Benz. But then we'll get you yeah. a nice house. No, I, I bought the mountain as my very first, you know, house oh, yeah. ever. Yeah. <laughs> now, you know, you, had to, you have to work your way up. I uh, tell people my story all the time. You know, my wife and I rented our very first apartment together. You know, we got married because we're poor. And then, you know, super exciting buying our very first house together and then getting house number two. And it's like, you know, we keep upgrading. But it's like, it's a it's a process. Yeah, 100%. I mean, I... I think that people lose track of that. So it's funny when they, they watch people like us on YouTube and they're like, these guys can do it. So we're showing them the kind of the pathway to how to do it. But then when they show up to the real estate market or they show up to the car market, it's like, I feel like they just lose track of that. The humbleness is gone. Now that's the, you know, I want to get that instant gratification. I need that beautiful house. I need that Highline vehicle to be in my life. For yeah. no more than three hundred dollars a month. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, yeah. I wish my uh, Tesla payment was three hundred bucks a month. But yeah, dude. It, I, I like the model. I think it provides a need. You know, when I look at any business, I look at, hey, is there a need? And is someone filling that need? Yeah. And if not, then there's a business to be made there. And, yeah. and a business at the end of the day is, you know, people think about it for the money perspective. And it is, you know, you got to make money to stay in business. But business is all about filling needs in the world. You know, the reason that Amazon exists today is because they saw that, hey, first off, people need books. Like, you know, everyone's got to go to the bookstore or the library. Like, we can just give them books online. Nobody's doing it. Yeah. Okay, perfect. And then now they're like, you know what? Why do people need to go to Walmart to buy all this stuff? Like, why can't we just deliver it to them in two days? Nobody does that. All right, we're going to do it. You know, now they're like, yeah, why can't we deliver your groceries to you in 30 minutes? Oh, and, yeah, 100%. You know, they're, just, they're just identifying needs, and it's like any... I, I would just encourage anyone listening, think about like a problem you have in life and just like, if it makes you that mad and you can't find a solution, there's probably a business to be made there. Oh, definitely. Like um, to touch one more thing on buy here, pay here is that's something that I saw. So a lot of people feel that this type of business is low brow, like, oh, your dealership, you're taking advantage of people, which it's nothing like that. You're actually, like I said, 
helping people get financed. But people don't realize is that there's people out there like Wells Fargo, Bank of America, people like myself that go out and purchase paper and build portfolios. We sell them to stock funds, um, hedge fund managers, other banks, and they actually put it on the stock market and people borrow against it for the interest or to make money off of it. So it's a very big lucrative business that a lot of people are starting to open up their eyes because especially now with bonds being such a low rate and return and everything else, people are getting more creative. And that's why we're getting so many people wanting to invest into buy her payer because it's such a lucrative thing. Well, as it relates to investing, you know, obviously that's one of our mission statements of the podcast. You're starting to see so many alternative forms of investing. And I think, like I said, when you first told me the buy here, pay here model, I said, that is a good investment because, you know, it's a higher return. It doesn't have a lot of uh, competition. It's, uh, you know, still got assets behind it. You know, you can still repossess the car, worst case scenario. Um, so it's got a lot of good things going for it as far as a safe investment. It's just unheard of at the moment. Correct. And you're starting to see people invest in some things that you wouldn't traditionally think of investments. Like you're looking at these Pokemon cards, sports cards. Um, we were actually just talking on another podcast about NFTs. People are buying this digital art. Bitcoin and Ethereum are going nuts. Yeah. Like people are realizing that, you know what? The stock market is not the only way to get a return. And I definitely don't want to hold cash right now. Yeah. So I need to look at alternative forms. And I'll, I'll tell you, I think, you know, the buy here, pay here models for sure are going to be something that um, catches fire. You know, I don't know how long it'll take, but you're going to see more dealerships do it. Oh, yeah. We're, we're, trying, we're trying to preach that. So this way we can get more uh, dealers to actually do this because when you control the financing, you control your sales and you can control your future where, you know, they always have this saying, the person that makes the most money is the person that lends the money. So it's like, yeah, why not be the bank for yourself? Yeah. Being the bank gives you control of all aspects of everything. So, yeah, I love that model. A um, couple other things I want to discuss with you, but before we jump into those, let's hear a word from our sponsors. Are you looking to grow your real estate investing business? My company, Future Flipper, can help. We've taught hundreds of people all over the country how to flip, wholesale, and buy rental properties. And it doesn't matter where you're at in your investing journey. Whether you're trying to get your first deal or scale your company, Future Flipper can help. We have courses, coaching, and events for all levels of investors. So if you want to take the next step, go to futureflipper.com and book a free consultation to see how we can best help you. Once again, that's futureflipper.com. One of the hardest parts about real estate investing is finding a good contractor. That's where Southwestern Custom Construction comes in. They've been doing remodels in Nevada and Arizona since 2006. As a fully licensed and bonded general contractor, they're able to help with any type of renovation, all the way from an entry-level fixer-upper to a custom luxury home. Southwestern Custom Construction specializes in working with investors. I've personally used them on many of my projects, so I know their team is legit. If you want to get a bid on a project, head over to customhomenow.com. Once again, that's customhomenow.com. Are you looking to find off-market real estate deals? One of the best tools my team uses is Batch Leads. With Batch Leads, you're able to pull data, manage lists, and send text messages. On top of that, you can get nationwide access to the MLS to get pictures and comps. My team has used Batch Leads to get some of our best deals, so I know it works. If you want to start today, you can get half off your first month by going to batchleads.io and using the promo code RYAN. Once again, that's batchleads.io, promo code RYAN for half off your first month. Now, back to the show. All right, we're back. So let's talk about some other ways to make money, you know, in the car industry. You know, you and I went to the auction, right? And I saw it firsthand. Like I said, guys, if you haven't seen that video, um, we'll link to it on YouTube. Uh, if you're not subscribed, by the way, to, to my YouTube channel, make sure you go do that. Make sure you subscribe to this podcast uh, on Apple Podcast and the YouTube channel. And um, you'll see that video with Lucky. His channel's tagged on there as well. But um, in the auction right? I saw it firsthand. It's freaking chaos, dude. Like, you know, like I never seen so many cars in my life. And just tell me like, what does it look like making money over there, man? Like wh where do you even begin? Yeah. I mean, the, the auction's a really exciting time now because we just were able to open up, you know, due to the whole pandemic and everything. And so 
everybody's getting back in full board. We're getting ready for taxes, which are right here now. Um, we're getting ready for the next, you know, stimulus checks that are being printed out for the next several months. Um, you know, there's a lot of people really coming back to the market that feel strong and confident. And the I've seen dealers kind of blow up everywhere. The big hot thing right now is rental cars. So the rental car market is blowing up because one, Hertz, Bob BK, we lost probably about 70 rental car companies, big places in airports and cities all across the world. A lot of these smaller uh, chains of those, the franchises actually lost their funding. So they all winded up getting wiped out with that. So you're looking at probably over 200 stores across the United States. And with these new apps, everything from Robinhood to Airbnb, now Uber, the next big thing that we see growing is Turo and Hirecar. Mm -hmm. These are two rideshare apps that give any person the ability to become a rental car business owner pretty much overnight. And the returns that we've been seeing is ridiculous. I mean, I, we should definitely do a show about putting your you know, Tesla on there just for fun, just to kind of see how people <laughs> and how much money you make. But, um, you know, we've seen people rent their regular cars out and just start growing immensely. Um, we got up to about 30 cars before we sold our dealership to uh, the company that I work with now. And uh, I'm trying to, I'm begging them to get back in the market. It's hot because a lot of the people that traditionally could buy cars are not buying cars. And Vegas is one of those weird cities where people don't care. Oh, what is it? 200 bucks a week to drive this car. I don't want to buy it. I don't do the maintenance. I'll just rent it. Yeah. And there's a new type of owner, you know, um, ever since Uber came out, less and less millennials are buying cars. They're taking Uber ride shares, renting cars for if they want to go on a weekend trip with their friends to California. Yeah. It's completely changed the game. I believe that the rental car market is a big next big thing. That's the big thing. So even at, at the car auction, right? Are we starting to see a ton of these rental cars show up there now since they're filed BK? Yeah, they they hit the market and we thought that there'd be a massive drop in pricing, but it was the complete opposite because there were so many new people getting into this business that you know, they Hertz had these big sales, they were all bought up. So even with more supply, it didn't change anything. You know, this, what we've seen in the stock market and what the economy happened last year, and then even with cars, what we normally see, oh, well, there's a bunch of supply, the demand's low, it's going to go low, and the prices just seem to keep going <laughs> up in, in the cars The demand too. keeps increasing. I mean, you know, it makes sense, looking at it from an economic perspective. Um, a lot of people don't know, I actually got an economics degree, and you would think like, oh man, with increased supply of all this stuff and people aren't, don't have jobs, the demand's going to be low and yeah. all this, but we've seen the exact opposite. The one thing that we did not factor on was all the liquidity in the market. You know, all this stimulus is propping up that new demand. And so the demand might not be coming from traditional mom and pop who lost their jobs, but the retail, not the retail, the big investors have more money than ever. You know, I made more money than I ever had in my life during COVID. And it's just like that happened for a lot of wealthy people. Same thing here. Yeah. You know, kicked and, off both of our channels. Yeah. And <laughs> so it's just like with that, the wealthy people see opportunity, you know, and they're like, okay, I got to put my dollars to work somewhere else, you know? So, you know, I think the, the auctions are interesting based on what you and I were doing. It looks very competitive now. People are paying more than ever because there's more money than ever now. Um, so I, I do like that alternative that we're talking about here with the rentals. Like, let's go into that. Tell me, you know, I, I've heard the concept of Turo. I, I've, I've, you know, to me, it's more of like a luxury car app. I could be completely wrong. And uh, basically, I just go on the app and I can go rent someone's car. Like, how, do, how does it all work? Like, it, do I have to go to their house? Like, how would I even get the car? Because obviously I need a car. Yeah. Like, how does it work? So, so Turo gives you a few options. You could either deliver the car for additional fee or they can come to your house. You can meet at a set place and it gives you the freedom to rent to pretty much most people. And I think that's why Turo is blowing up. So if you come into Vegas and let's say you're here for the weekend and you're ready to have fun and you don't have a credit card, none of our rental car companies will even take you. You could say, look, I'm, I'm a billionaire. I, I don't need a credit card. I got cash. I, I got $100,000 in just this checking account to rent a car. Every rental car place here will say no, even if you're trying to rent the cheapest car. Where Turo, it syncs to your debit card and it syncs to your bank account and gives anybody the option to rent a car, no matter if they're you know 18 years old, because that's a big thing too. If you're 18 right. years old, you can't rent a car. 
But when I was 18, I was traveling. That's kind of the business. dumbest role I've ever, like, <laughs> I'm yeah, always you, like. You can go to war and you could join yeah. the military. You could play professional sports, but you can't, you can't rent a car. Right. You know, so. You got to pay taxes. Yeah. So it gives <laughs> you that option to do that. And then also, um, you know, with Turo rising up so quickly, it's giving people the freedom to give people cars more affordably than ever before. So if, let's say, we want to go take a weekend trip to San Diego and we want to rent a convertible Mustang just to have a nice cruise down there. If we go to somewhere like Enterprise or Hertz or something like that, you're looking at maybe be on a weekend, a popular weekend, maybe a hundred bucks a day with uh, insurance, and they're probably gonna have to pay additional, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Or Turo, you rent it on the app. The owner that rents it, let's say it's your car, is a hundred percent insured through Turo up to a million dollars. And then also the client gets that same car with good insurance and a fraction of the cost. Yeah. You know, I've never rented on Toro, but like I travel so much, right? Yeah. I should. Should I start doing that? I would totally recommend it because, you know, one of the things like we kind of talked about when you guys were out shopping for your car, you know, best way, like when I have people like, well, I want to buy, I want to make a big purchase. Like my friend, he went and bought a Tesla. I don't know if I want a Tesla. I hear it's too quiet. It's weird. I'm like, why don't you get on Toro, rent one for the day, take you and your wife out, drive up and down the strip, see how it feels. Yeah. And it's the best way to get a full Test drive, no salesman in the back barking at you. Like, isn't this a great car? You should buy it. You know, it's like it gives you the opportunity to do that. And then I kind of made it as a, a thing of mine where every time I go to a different city, I drive a different car. So if yeah. I'm like, hey, the new C8 Corvette came out. Let me drive that. Okay, I drove that. You know what? I just saw that Kia made the best minivan. So I got some uh, car reviews coming up on my channel, and that's how I did them. I literally just rented cars on tour, <laughs> drove them around, you know, and, and showed them off. And, you know, and it's like classic cars. You know, most people can't afford some of these rare cars. There's a lot of amazing things on Turo that make it affordable for everybody to rent. Yeah, that's funny. You're renting the best minivan, dude. I like it. Yeah. That, it's... That's going to be my go-to. <laughs> <laughs> but, okay, so Turo's great, obviously. It's like the Airbnb of cars. Yes. That, that's pretty much how I see it. Um, let's talk about my Tesla. How would it logistically work? Because I got to charge it, too, you know? Correct. So, okay, I would charge the Tesla. They could pay me a delivery fee if I deliver it to them, or they're coming to my house or somewhere, and I'm just handing them the keys and I'm out. Yeah. So when when the customer comes in, you first first you put take pictures of your car. I always tell people take good pictures. You post it online and you can set the price. Now, when you're a new person, I always say don't do that. There is an auto pricing feature that basically matches you up with whatever your market is, because you may think in your head your car is only worth a hundred. But if it's peak season and all the Teslas are rented, your car gets bumped up to $200 a day. Right. So now, you know, it shoots it up automatically for you. After that, you can choose whether the customer comes there or not. Once they show up, basically the app, you take pictures of the car all the way around to make sure there's no damage before. You take a picture of the person's ID. All goes into Turo. You hand them the keys. They drive away. From that second, you're insured 100%. Got it. So tell me, my Tesla, for example, what could I rent it for? I've seen those things go for anywhere from two hundred to five hundred dollars a day. That's crazy. So, yeah. what, like, how often would it get rented? If, like, let's just say, I didn't need it, you know, like, it's it's open all the time. I would say that it would pay for itself in your car, and if you rent it out at least seven times a month, you would make money, pay your car note and your insurance, and be able to drive your car for free. That's the new thing that's going on. What's called car hacking? Yeah. You know, and I did the same thing when I first bought my G-Wagon. You know, I was so excited, but I'm more of a sports car guy. And so it sat there in my driveway. So I put it on Turo, 200 bucks a day, just see what I get. And I started getting just tons of people using it. It got to the point where it was paying for itself. And so I got to drive my car for free for a whole year. And it didn't <laughs> cost me anything. And then everyone's like, well, they're going to destroy your car. And I'm sure they're watching. Oh, they're going to mess it up. They Turo don't. pays for it. That, but how often did, like, you have issues? Very, very rare. Yeah. Out of a fleet of like 60, 70 cars, I think maybe once every three months we get some random thing. It's only because we're in Vegas. <laughs> you know, you get somebody that pukes in your car. Somebody brings a dog. You know, we put big stickers everywhere. Hey, don't smoke in our car. Right. But Turo, like when I have any issues, hey, this client smoked in my car. Um, this customer puked or whatever had a dog. I'm going to charge him a $400, $500 cleaning fee. Turo, no questions asked. You take the pictures. You send it to them. Money's in your account. Nice. Yeah, I um I get that a lot with Airbnb. People are like, oh, they're going to trash stuff. It's like, no, pe people are fine. They The people who use these apps are just a different type of person. 
you know, versus just like how we would think the world would be. Yeah. You know, it's, it's that mystique of like, oh, well, they're, they're not doing traditional realms. They must be shady. It's just a bunch of younger people that know tech that that's the new thing. Like why pay $300 for a hotel room when they can rent your, maybe your whole apartment for $200 and exactly. be free to come and go There's as no they point. please, you know, don't have to worry about anything, you know, and it's, and that's what people want. Maybe they don't want the smoke. Maybe they don't want the gambling. Yeah. You give them that opportunity. Yeah. So man, I'm just thinking from my, my model X, you know, I planned on potentially trading it in at some point for, you know, I, I ordered the Rivian R1S that I'm really excited about. Nice. So when that comes out in like August, September, whenever I get it, I was like, all right, I don't really need two SUV, two electric SUVs. They're like the same thing, yeah. you know, but I'm <laughs> like, at that point, would it make sense to just keep it? Because number one, I, you know, I'll have another car. That's, that's cool. But number two, I'll still get the tax benefits of owning that car. Oh, yeah. I mean, I would definitely keep it, rent it out, get the depreciation, your other tax benefits. Um, that car probably alone will pay for that car as well as your new vehicle. That's good. So, <laughs> all right, you're changing my, my mindset here. So tell me, a guy like me, you know, I don't really care. It's not worth my time to, like, yes. go do Turo myself. What do I do? Um, there's a lot of third-party apps where they take care of it for you. So right. with Turo, you can do automatic check-in, check-out. So like you have a Tesla, you actually have the option on your phone where you could leave the keys in there. The customer submits the pictures in their ID, and you just press the button, your car unlocks, they drive away with it. So you don't, if you don't have the time, you could literally, literally leave it parked in front of your office. Have them do that. You don't have to touch it when they bring it back. Have one of your people clean it, put it back up there. Because most of the rentals, I never even meet the people. I have them parked all over the city. Huh. On my app, they say this customer's coming. They send me a picture of the IDs, confirm it. I press unlock, car unlocks. They get in the car, they drive away. Especially with this pandemic, it made everybody so virtual that you really don't have to mess with people. That's why rental cars are blowing up right now. I also have seen people, you know, open up these um, luxury car, like uh, not dealerships, but, uh, you know, like the racing tracks and stuff, like, you know, cause I've actually had a friend, he's like, yeah, we're starting this, uh, you know, business, super good investment. Like if you just buy the car, you can let it go at our business. We'll split profits and it'll pay for itself. You know, you could buy a Lambo right now and it'll pay for itself. That's the pitch. Yeah. I mean, it's, I'll be honest. There are some companies here in Vegas that do an amazing job and they're extremely profitable. We've bought in some of their cars at auction and they've handed us the titles cause they owned them cash because they paid them off a year ago from all the trips from the tourists. But it's, my opinion, it's just a lot of risk because the most expensive thing when it comes to Ferraris, Lambos, and and some of these other Highline cars is the maintenance. I mean, you burn a clutch out in a, uh, uh, a 48 Ferrari, you're looking at twelve, fourteen thousand dollars just for the clutch, another five grand for service. Wow! And all it takes is some guy to drop the transmission or do launch control three times, and you roast your clutch. <laughs> and so that's why these guys are trying to do track driven ones, so they don't drive them on the streets. They basically force them to drive. So if you hedge your bet with having less fun, but more of a consistent, I guess, income, I mean, I see it as a, as a plausible business model, but I don't know. I, to me, it's like those cars are meant to be driven around. Like the whole point of people renting these Ferraris is because they want to be seen in them. They're, most people that rent these exotic cars from us don't go on the track and go 200 miles an hour. They drive, they drive on the strip at 20 miles an hour with the windows down with 110 degrees. So everybody <laughs> can see them. Or they're, you know, making their YouTube videos and IG posts, you know, just, yeah. you know, post it up. What up? What up? Yeah. You know, I, I made got my Benz, got yeah. my, well, not my Benz, my Ferrari and my yeah. Lambo. Yeah. Well, Benz too. I, yeah. I mean, you saw my car. I love my car too. And it's in the same realm, but yeah. What is your car? Which, which one is that? Uh, AMG GTS. GTS. That car's so, sick. I yeah. like that. 503 horsepower, and the big reason I bought it is because I can drive it every day. 48 Ferrari, kind of close to the same horsepower, but I don't think I could drive it on the rallies that I go on. How's the um, the gas work with Turo? Same deal? Like, you got to bring it back how it came? Exactly. Um, when you Everything you do, you get dinged on just like a regular rental car company, and the best thing is Turo reminds people. So if you're not an experienced business owner, Turo almost gives you the guidelines and the structure to say, hey, what's the gas? Take a picture of the gas. Take a picture of the miles. Right. Take a picture of the tires. It forces you to look at all these things. So if the customer brings it back and it's empty, you just submit it to Turo, and Turo reimburses you for your gas. Right. 
the only like <laughs> you know it's so great that the tesla is electric but that's the only bad part like they're not going to bring it back with a full battery yeah i mean that's the only thing i know that some people are worried about one of my friends he has a whole fleet of teslas and I think he's got 14 right now here in Vegas that rents just on Turo. Wow. And he's so worried that most people, you know, when it, when it gets low on battery, it's dinging, it's telling you to pull over, it's probably blowing up your phone, sending you <laughs> messages. And he sees us and he freaks out because most people are like, well, if I stop somewhere, I can just push it. You can't push these cars. Like once you run out of juice, that's it. It's a wrap, you know? I don't know who thinks that, but like, yeah, if I run, I just push it. Like I've, that's never crossed my mind. <laughs> yeah. You know, and those things, they don't realize how heavy they are. Like you're, your uh, Tesla weighs more than your Lincoln Navigator. Oh, really? Yeah. Because that battery is that heavy. The battery is huge. So you lose all the metal from the motor and everything, but you gain all the weight from the battery. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Man, that's going to have to get, that's giving me something to consider because I had pretty much in my mind decided that, yeah, you know what? It's just, I'll probably get the Rivian and trade it in. But yeah, it might make more sense just to Turo it and have them all. Yeah, I mean, it gives you the opportunity to do different things. You get high-end clients to come in town for your training or whatever else. Give yeah. them a car and, <laughs> and work that in. The next, uh, that that's my next giveaway. Drive my Tesla for the next uh, week, <laughs> you know, because I don't, I don't need it. It's on Turo. Yeah. yeah. You know what? It actually is probably worth it for the content. I, I put my Tesla on Turo for a week. You won't believe what happened. There's the title. That's the clickbait. 100%. You'll probably get 100,000 views easy. Probably. I need to just do it. <laughs> All right, but that means I need to buy another car, so need the Rivian to come here already. Yeah, I'm thinking about doing the same thing. Once um, I get my R8, I wanted to do something with the Mercedes, but we're going to see how it goes. This next few months have been very interesting since, as yeah. you know, YouTube's picking up, and yeah. a lot of good things are happening for people here. Yeah. What do you think um, on a – like on a sports car note, dude, what, what should I get if I, if I get a sports car? I've never owned one. I'm always an SUV guy. I, I mean, the AMG GTS is a great car cause you could drive it every day and you don't have to worry about dependability, but we talked about before the tech, the tech is huge in my car where you get some of these other cars. The tech is really not that great. You know, you go out and you spend a hundred, two hundred thousand $200,000 on a car and you can't even stream Bluetooth music. They get, they get a little upset, but... Uh, it's got analog. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, you know, I would say for you, especially with your personality and your style, I would say AMG GTS, twin turbo Porsche, or an Audi R8. Because they're all luxury sports cars, but you could still pick your clients up or even take your wife on a nice day trip, and yeah. they're just, they're daily driv drivable. Okay. Yeah, I, I really like the Mercedes you have. That is super cool. Um, you know, I've always liked Porsche. They're... They're sweet. Beautiful cars. Um, yeah, I'm curious. I, I definitely, at some point, I'll buy a sports car. You that's know. it. Would that that be the next video? We should get on Turo and just test one of each. Yeah, that's that the, is, that that's is the a best good way idea. to start Just it. to figure out which one I like. Yeah, it's like, hey, you know what? I drove the twin turbo Porsche. It was great. Let me try maybe the BMW i8. Okay, and let me try the AMG GTS, which I'll give you a smoking deal if you rent mine. <laughs> um, and then uh, uh, try the Audi R8. And this way, it'll give you all facets. Be a good YouTube video. Also, give you the chance where you can have more than a few hours with it. Because I tell everybody just, you know, when you buy these cars, especially like sports cars that are like this expensive and rare, it's like you want to drive them for a little while because you may not even like it. You may be like, God, I can't see out of this thing or it's really awkward or whatever else. You know, because I had a lot of friends of mine that were really like taller, big guys, professional athletes that bought C8 Corvettes. That's not a big guy car. Like once they squeezed into there, they were definitely sad. They were like, well, I thought it'd be bigger. It's an American sports car. I'm <laughs> like, nah, bro, it's... It's a mid-engine car. It's a much more smaller, compact thing. And so now they got an $80,000 car that they can't even drive comfortably. So now it just sits in the driveway. We were actually talking about the Corvette. Like, it's they significantly dropped the price and, like, made it way better and cooler. It's like... Oh, yeah. I mean, it's... It seems like a great value. I'm still to this day, like, every day I see one at the auction, like we did the other day, and I just look at it, I'm like, should I just pull the trigger, you know? <laughs> and, and I've done a few reviews on them, and, and I've taken out a few of my friends' rentals, and... They're just, for the money, you can't beat it. For sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000, it will smoke the tires off of pretty much anything. The reliability and just the tech. The tech is unbelievable. I mean, the way they have the dash set up, it's almost like you're sitting in a fighter jet. Everything is basically viewed by the, uh, the actual driver. Like, everything is focused on you. But it's just amazing. Like, the, the GPS in this thing is so badass. Sorry, I don't know if I can say that. <laughs> um, when you drive around, and when you slow down for potholes, it remembers that, so it lifts the air suspension up. So Shut if, up. If you know, no way. If you know that you have a dip in your front driveway and you always hit the air button for your suspension, 
your car remember that every time you drive Tesla home. don't even do that. No. That's crazy. Yeah, Chevy's one of the first ones to do it. And the stuff they got coming out for next year's Corvette is even even more insane. So should I get the AMG or should I get the Corvette then, dude? I mean, if if you're gonna drive it for fun, I would get the vet. But if we're using it for business and to flex a little bit on YouTube and Instagram, the Mercedes. Okay. That's good to know. You know, you know what would be the ultimate flex? I just get both. I'm like, you know what? Oh, yeah. <laughs> this, this car I drive on Tuesdays. This one's yeah, Wednesdays. Yeah, this is, this is my, uh, you know, the the 26th. They're like, the 26th? Yeah, just drive it the 26th of every month, you know? Got one for every day of the yeah. month. I, I totally see it in your future, man. The way things are going <laughs> everything else, I mean, I believe it. You know, it's funny. I've never, like, truly been a car guy. Um, I mean, obviously, I know what the cars are, but it's just like I've never really wanted a sports car. Ever. I don't think I've ever even, yeah, I've never owned one. Yeah. And even with, you know, the cars now, like I drove a 2013 Lexus RX even after I was making really good money. You know, I paid 20 grand for it. And then when I got my, a, a newer one, you know, I paid 40 grand for it. And I was like, dude, that's like my limit. Yeah. That, that's a lot of money. And uh, then I bought the Tesla last year and I was like, all right, this is pretty cool. This is nice driving around um, just because it's like so much better than anything yeah. else out there. And now I'm like, yeah, you know, I got some disposable income. Maybe I'll I'll splurge a little bit, get that date night car. I, I think so because like a lot of people see as a car as a depreciating asset and it's not, you know, very savvy where I've seen more people or, you know, speak of, you know, Graham, you know, he just picked, Picked up his Ford GT, beautiful car. That car is probably going to be worth in two years, maybe four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. So he made an amazing purchase, and so I've seen a lot more, more savvier, more kind of restrictive customers coming into the Highline and exotic car market. That's why it's once again these right alternative now. investments, right? Alternative like who, investments. Who would think that you know buying a old Ford GT like that like is going to be a good deal? You know, it, we we think about luxury cars as always a bad deal. Oh, yeah, 100%. Like, we, we get in arguments all the time when we sell Highline cars. You know, like, why should I buy this Ferrari? Because more than likely, you're going to drive it for two years, have some fun with it, and you may actually sell it for more than what it's actually worth. No, it's impossible. And I'm like, anything that's in limited production, and you got to remember, there's, what is it, uh, 100 millionaires made every minute or something like that. Really? I there was, in the world, it's like 100 new millionaires. So Ferrari can only make so many cars because they're still hand-built. So eventually, these There's a lot of new millionaires up. that want them. Exactly, you know. And I think the thing about cars is, you know, you don't have to be a car person. I think the fact that you get something that's so rare, exotic, and you appreciate the value. And I don't know, my thing is when I get in my car, my mind goes free. I enjoy the drive. I, I have fun with it. I mean, I use it for my business because you can't be in the car business and have a bad car. It's like being a dentist and having bad teeth or being a real estate agent and being homeless. It's like, you got to have, <laughs> you know, some, something like that. But, uh, you know, but when it came to like, you know, like, like Graham's purchase, you know, he, he got bit by the car bug. You're going to do the same thing. Like I guarantee you, we got to go to the track one day, and we'll take out some of these cars. Yeah. It'll be a wrap. You'll I'll be like, I, I'm going to buy one. Yeah, and I, next thing you know, you know, have a good month. All of a sudden, I'm like, hey, how's it going, Ryan? You're like, dude, I just bought the new Tesla, the new Roadster, the AMG, a Corvette, <laughs> and the new Audi, you know? If, if I bought <laughs> five cars in a month, let me tell you, I don't even know how much money I'd be making that like I did that. But, you know, who knows? Um. But yeah, dude, that that's funny, and I, I got to tell you, you are definitely a car dealer because you sold me really hard for the last <laughs> fifteen minutes, and like I think uh, I'm definitely like, all right, you know, let me go check out this uh, C8 here once we're done with this podcast, man. So you're a car dealer for sure. Um, <laughs> but speaking of being a car dealer, you've got this segment on YouTube that's uh, it's called Dealer Confessions, yes, sir. and. Uh, by the way, guys, if you're not following him on YouTube or subscribed, uh, go check out Automotive Life. That's his YouTube channel, and uh, you can see a bunch of the stuff we're talking about. But I thought it'd be fun to do something that, you know, dealer confessions on your side, and then I'll do, like, real estate confessions on my side, just, like, different funny stories. So No, totally. I think this would be a good, uh, a good, uh, good segment. Yeah, tell me. So give me one. All right, so we will go over our first one, which will be, what is the craziest sale we ever made? That's that's like a segment you do? What's the craziest sale? Well, that's yeah. one of the segments in dealer, cent or in dealer confessions. But, you know, when whether you're in sales, everybody has these stories where you just, 
had to go maybe the customer was crazy. Maybe you had to go extraordinary lengths to make the sale. So however you determine your crazy sale, I'll give you my version, and then we'll go into your uh, real estate confessions. And see okay, I gotta, I'm going to have to think about that. I didn't know that was going to be a question. Okay, but you go on yours. I'll, okay. I'll come up with mine. So one of our craziest ones is we had a client that just hit a jackpot at the Wynn Casino. And they were like, we saw that you had a 2016 Escalade. This was probably back in 2017, so it was only a year old. We want to pay for it cash. And I'm like, okay. He goes, but we have to pick up our money at 2 a.m. Because they, when you get these big casino jackpots, sometimes you can get a check or they give you cash. They opted for cash, so they told me I had to come back in a few hours. Uh-huh. They're like, are you willing to meet us at the Wynn Casino at 2.30 in the morning? <laughs> you know, so I was sitting there. I was like, you know what? It could be a joke. could be a totally bad prank. Maybe one of my friends are getting me. I'm going to go do it. Drove there, picked the couple up. And they were just screaming up and down, laughing. She's like, yeah, my wife wanted the Escalade. This was the time when a uh, Ferrari dealership was a win. They talked Ferrari into coming in. They bought a Ferrari California. Drove to our dealership. We're doing the paperwork. They are just completely blitzed. I mean, they had a blast. I think they won $3.2 million in one of the Megabox things. So, you know, so I was like, well, let me know on the lot if you want anything. And they're like, well, you know what? My cousin needs a car. No problem. Well, my aunt needs a car. I was like, <laughs> you guys pick anything else, I'll take $1,000 off of every car. And it was just insane. I think it was like a $190,000 day. We sold 10 cars at, I think I got out of there at 530 in the morning after I wrote all the placards, everything else, set up all the shipping. Um, they flew back to Florida. I put all the cars on the tracking thing, uh, truck and shipped them out. And it was just insane. But it was probably one of the funnest things I ever did and one of my most craziest sales. Dude, that's crazy. Oh man. Well, I can't I can't top that. Um <laughs> you know, for us, I would have to think about it on like the purchase side. Cause I mean, here's the deal with most of our deals, right? On the the selling side, it's just a typical realtor, realtor transaction. You know, we don't really hear from the buyer about crazy stuff. Um, and then on the purchase side, you know, we buy a lot of deals from other people, so we're not like too involved with the situation. So I'd have to think about you know, when we went direct to the seller, you know, and hearing oh, the seller's yeah. story about, <laughs> you know, how it happened. But yeah, one of the craziest houses we bought, man, was, it was super disgusting. I'd never saw it in person, but I heard many horror stories about it. We, uh, put this house under contract, right? And the guy, you know, had, I don't know when the last time he had let somebody in his house, but, or no, the, the seller had never been in it like in years. He had a tenant. And oh, so geez. We, we went to the tenant. Um, he's like, just go knock on the door, whatever. Tenant wouldn't open up, wouldn't open up. He's like, dude, like if, if anything, just try and like get through the window, whatever. So finally, like we get through the window and um, no one's home or anything, but the whole floor is black. And you're like, what is going on here? It was all crap. Like the entire floor oh, was crap. It's... And there were, <laughs> dude, and there was dogs in there and everything. And the backyard was immaculate. There was nothing, no crap in the backyard, nothing. Like, he just didn't let his dogs out. Oh, wow. And, <laughs> dude, it was like my my partner, Nick, was the one who went on the appointment and saw it. He said, like, immediately within five seconds of being in the house, he had to, like, jump back out, throw up, and, you know, like, <laughs> dude, the most nasty thing you've seen. So, like... It was, and I, he sent a picture of it and like from the picture you look at it and you're like, is the floor like just black and dirty? Like what is, and you look close and you're like, dude, it's literally just caked on the entire floor. Oh, you, it sounds like you guys should have turned him into that TV show. Was it hoarders? Yeah. You guys guys probably could have got a contract just for that house. We should have, (laughs) but we should have got a way better deal too. We were inexperienced at the time, but I would have offered the guy way less than what we ended up buying it for because that house needed so much like uh, oh my goodness. Like, I don't even know the words for it. Like getting rid of the remediation of just everything, you know, cause we had to bring in like, I don't even remember the type of company we brought in. It was terrible. Wow. No, that's, that's pretty awesome. Definitely love to see pictures if you got that. <laughs> yeah. Um, then the next one I would like to do is, you know, cause everybody always talks about how much money we make, but we, we never talk about how much money we lose. So one of my funny things on dealer confessions is I would talk about some of the, my biggest losses. So I talked already about a classic Mustang. You can watch the video. But recently, probably about last year or so, right before I sold my dealership to this other company, I made a huge bonehead mistake. So this is one of my biggest losses. Um, during the auction, what you see, we line up all the cars, 
and you know you put your prices on what you want for them. Well, I did this one online at the time because I was in a rush. I usually go in person to always rep my cars. That's a good rule if you're a dealer. Always go in person, rep your cars. And when I was typing it online, I was like, okay, I need five thousand for this car. I need um, two thousand for this car. Twenty thousand for this car. Blah blah blah. I, I had five cars that I basically just wanted to blow out. And I made the mistake of just putting it in there, and I didn't put the decimal for the, the cent sign. Okay. So we're talking $5,000 cars saying as long as you get $500, you can sell it. <laughs> $20,000 cars, give me two grand and you can have it. Wow. So, you know, so they ran them, and 100%, it was on me. They ran them. They're like, bro, we sold every single car, and you got over what you wanted. I was You're like, like, no way. Nice. And they're like, yeah, yeah, all together, you got like $18,000. And I'm like... No, I wanted twenty grand just for the F one hundred and fifty, and I looked and I saw that I was such a bonehead, and I rushed and I didn't take the time to double check myself, and I lost. I think it was almost thirty thousand dollars at the auction that day. Jeez, you know, and it goes to show people that, like I said, like this is all fun and games, and we love what we do, but <laughs> we're not perfect. And I made tons of bonehead mistakes. That's why I love to talk about it. But yeah, um, what do you feel, either cash wise, time wise, or money wise? What would you feel was your like biggest mistake or bonehead loss? Oh man! Like how many? Uh, <laughs> how many times? Yeah, time like got? how much? <laughs> how much time we got, dude? Uh, yeah, dude, I've lost so much money on on just bad deals and stupid things. I mean, when I look at losing money, it's in many ways. Like, there's literally you know bad deals we buy that we lost money on. There's marketing we did that didn't work and produce any results. There's you know opportunities that I missed out on because I was dumb and I was like, oh, that's stupid. You know, whatever. Um, just straight up what comes to mind is I actually did a YouTube video on our biggest loss as far as like paper loss of like this mobile home we bought and I screwed that up in so many different, it took two <laughs> years, it took two years to sell. Number one, Wow. number two, it wasn't what we thought it was. Uh, we thought it was converted to real property, which means that we're able to get financing on it, you know, not don't have to do the buy here, pay here model when, oh, when it can get geez. financing on it. But it turns out you, you couldn't, you know? So now that put us in cash only. Other thing, we, uh, it was a two bedroom house. We, we were going to make it a three bedroom, but my project manager just never did it. You know, he kept it as a two bedroom. It's like, well, our value was based on it being a three bedroom, you know? But I was like, ah, you know what, whatever. It, it'll sell still. Who cares? Let's just put it on the market. And I just never watched it or anything and just kept sitting. It's oh. two years later, it finally sold. Two birthdays. Wow. Yeah. I, what What do you feel that you lost during that time? Like time, money? Um, I didn't lose any time because I didn't pay any attention to it. And that's why it was such a bad loss. <laughs> <laughs> you know, had I like actually been there and like looking at like, yo, what are we doing? Like, let's, let's get this fixed. Yeah. It wouldn't have been that bad, but it's just it just sat there and sat there and sat there, and we had people in contract, and then they backed out, then back in, and they backed out because that that was what kept happening. Yeah. I was getting strung along. I'm like, oh, okay, it's finally back under, and then it wasn't, and then uh, sure enough, you know, holding costs, money cost, everything just adds up. And I want to say I can't even remember because like, dude, once I once I lose, I'm like already on to the next thing. But I want to say that mobile lost like sixty grand something like that. Wow. A mobile. And you know, that was one of the lessons too, was in real estate. We think that, you know, cheaper homes have less risk, right? You can't lose as much money because think about it, right? A million dollar home. If things go wrong, you could lose a lot of money, which is true. And then you think with cheap homes, like what can go wrong? You know, at the end of the day, your holding costs aren't as high. Your, yeah. you know, your, your margin for error is a little bit easier because like you know I'm, i wasn't expecting to sell this thing for like two hundred thousand dollars i'm like yeah i'll sell it for like 140 whatever but no you can you can definitely lose a lot of money on a cheap <laughs> <laughs> so yeah no i mean i i, t I totally get that because like same thing with cars we get a lot of dealers that are like well i don't want to go anything expensive i want to go cheap because i'll save money like you said we're only going to lose five six grand but when you buy that little extra nicer house or that nicer car your chances of selling it a much nicer car is a lot better than, like you said, these damaged, beat-up mm -hmm. cars. Um, I got one last one that I think is pretty funny, and this one goes for both of us. What do you feel was your most embarrassing moment on YouTube? Something that either you did or you watch your videos later and you just kind of look at it, you're like, what was I saying? Why did I say that? Or, 
you know, or something that happened with a guest, like, you know, however you want to elaborate. I'll, I'll tell you mine. So I'll give you a chance to think about it. And, you know, one of my biggest embarrassments, I guess, as a YouTuber was, you know, I started my journey like a year and a half, two years ago, I made one video and I stopped and I never checked my messages. And at that time, I, it was my how to get a dealer's license video. And I didn't think it'd do any good. When I, the first week I had, I think it had like 200 views. Well, now it's, I think it's upwards of 200,000 views and it's my most popular video, but I was getting tons of messages, tons of feedback, people encouraging me, and I didn't check my messages. And finally, I had different companies, big companies, like uh, I think one was like Motor Trend. There's a few other ones are offering me like gigs to go do like promotional stuff and to go do car shows and things like that. And it was so embarrassing to me because, you know, as a professional, like we are always answering our phones, answering emails. You know, even during this podcast, everybody's still working right now as we're, we're filming this. And uh, it just, like, it slipped my mind. And now I look back, and I just, I lost all these amazing opportunities. And I was just, my to me, it was embarrassing. You guys yeah. may look at it and think it's I'm just a retard, but it's just, like, I was literally embarrassed over the whole situation. Yeah, no, for sure. I, nothing makes me more mad than a lost opportunity. You know, losing the 60 grand on the mobile, that, that also made me mad. But, um, yeah, yeah. The, the potential for opportunities is what is, like, really big. Um, you know, <laughs> I'd have to look to my crew over here. <laughs> you guys, does anyone over here remember our uh, most embarrassing moment? I can't think of, like, a big one off You're the like, top. You're like, which one? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Let me, let me go to the list of, of embarrassing things we did. Yeah. I don't think there's crazy. Yeah, I didn't say anything ridiculous. Thank <laughs> Technical errors. Yeah. I mean, when we first started, like there were some videos that we either filmed and it had like no audio or oh, just terrible God. audio. Nothing pissed me off more than that. Um, another one would be just losing the video. We've done that. We're like, where did the video go? And it's like, I remember filming it. I, it, I spoke it, but it's nowhere to be found. So Absolutely. it's just like the, actually those frustrate me more than anything. Cause they're like so trivial. Like it's, it's like, it's like not an error you should make. Oh, we can control yeah. that versus like if I just was on live TV and I screwed up and said something dumb, like that, that is what it is. It is you know, yeah, you know yeah. what am I going to do about it? But things we can control make me mad. Um, but I would say like similar to like what yours was with a missed opportunity. Um, you know, I get so many DMS a day now. So like there's definitely missed opportunities yeah. even with it. But I remember I was on TikTok. And I was like randomly looking through my DMs for the first time in like a couple of weeks. <laughs> <laughs> and I had saw that uh, Lewis Howe sent me a DM and he was like, hey, you know, let me uh, like, can you send me your tax info, like your tax guy info and all that stuff? Because I had done some TikToks about taxes that went viral. And um, I responded to him like a month later. <laughs> it was like, <laughs> I haven't, I haven't, you know, and I haven't got a hold of him and I'm sure I'll end up crossing his path yeah. at some point, whatever. But uh, it's just funny. It's like, dude, you know, when somebody DMs you, you got to strike while the iron's hot. Yeah. Um, you know, I actually had Giannis DM me, which was cool. But oh, I, nice. I, I was right. I was, I was ready for that one. <laughs> <laughs> so him and I have been talking, which is cool. But, uh, yeah, man, th those are some of the dumb things we've done. Well, one thing that you really hit on point is, like, you know, like as we started our YouTube journey, one of the things you said was like you filmed a whole video and got no audio. I did the exact same thing with a, uh, my friend, I can't say his name, but he's a, uh, entertainment consultant. So they were shooting a music video here in Vegas and he's like, Hey, we got a Bugatti Chiron. You got one hour, right? Come down here and shoot it. At this time it was just me. I didn't have any camera guys, nothing else. And, uh, they're like, you got to get here right, right now. It's at the Venetian. Just get here. So I called some random guy that I met a while back in one of these Facebook groups. I'm like, look, I'll give you whatever two grand, just come down here, shoot me, make this epic video. I want to make it nice. Do this video, do a little drive around the casino, talk all this stuff. I'm like, great, this could be my big video, my, my next big break, right? The one that's going to go viral. Yeah. We get it. Not only did the editor not, well, he put copyrighted music in everything. So <laughs> the first one. And then Tight. everything of me actually talking about the car, the audio was gone. Yeah. You know, and this was like one of those like once in a lifetime opportunities. And I told the guys like, this is like a $3.5 million car. Like, it's not like we can just walk up to the dealership and say, can I borrow one? You know, I was like, <laughs> I, I don't even have that type of pool. And, and I was like, this is just once in a lifetime. And I was super upset. And then, so everything we had was with the camera audio. So, you know, I'm over here and he's sitting there and I'm screaming 
and it just it was awful. But man, I, I mean, have you had a lot of blunders now that you're kind of figuring this out? Because I know <laughs> we talked a little bit off of camera about setting up studios and stuff, but have you yeah. had a lot of that? Um, we did when we first started. I would say now we're pretty much streamlined. We, you know, we don't have too many technical issues. Um, so yeah, thankfully we're good now. But uh, yeah, there's there's always a learning curve, man. <laughs> that oh, yeah. and and I I'm much better now too at double checking. So I think we're all double checking each other. You know, that's why I'm always like, mic check, mic check, right before everything. I'm looking at the video, making sure that you know nothing's in frame that shouldn't be, and that colors and every like I know what to look for as well now. So yeah. so it helps. But we're all double checking each other. So thankfully, the technical things are very limited at this point. Well, I know you have uh, a YouTube class. Is this some of the stuff that you guys talk about on your class? Yeah, so I have um, my Social Media Influencer Academy. Um, you guys can go get it at ryanpineda.com. Uh, teach everything as far as, you know, how to film, you know, doing little things like that that could save you a lot of time and headache oh, like we're serious. talking about. Yeah. Um, equipment, all that stuff. So, yeah, we talk about everything. Yeah, I might have to yeah. get that. Yeah, because, like, when I first started, like, you know, I was watching YouTube videos, and, man, just – I'm sure you can, you know, uh, same thing, just the mistakes we made and the silly stuff that just cost time and effort. One thing that you could have is a really good crew. That's my next phase is yeah. I need to get me a good crew so I can do some epic videos. Yeah, you got to get yourself a crew, dude. I uh, I don't know anything about editing or <laughs> switching or anything. All I know is like, hey, this video looks good. It sounds good. That's cool. Yeah. That's about it. Oh, it's so funny. Like when, when people watch some of my videos, they're like, oh, who's your video editor? Who's your camera guy? And some of my uh, videos, I actually have a tripod on a caster. I have a rope tied to my leg. And as I'm like talking, walking, I'm like dragging the camera <laughs> out of my leg. Wow. And so people are like, oh, it's YouTube magic. You know, you, we can't afford to do this. And I was just like, I'm sure you started with one camera. I started with my iPhone. Yeah. And, you know, now we're starting to build more of a studio set up. But it was just funny, some of the crazy stuff we did. Even, like, I had a drone follow me because I couldn't find a camera guy that wanted to work on the weekends. Wow. Yeah, so I was, like, setting it where it was tethering me. So I'm walking around filming, and everyone's like, oh, your videographer is really amazing. He didn't stumble at all. I'm like, oh, no, that's a drone follow me. <laughs> I just had to make sure I ran It's my buddy Droon. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. but uh, it was just kind of funny, just the evolution of, I guess, from where we started to where we're at now. And, yeah. and obviously, you passed me a little bit, but I'm like I said, I'm working on my studio right now, so hopefully – in the next few weeks, you can come visit me at mine. Yeah, no, we'll definitely check it out. Yeah, the one thing I've always done, you know, I actually just did a podcast with, uh, you know, my friends Landon and Jesse who are in my coaching program, and they were telling us how they, you know, hung fans and did all this stuff at their very first flips and everything like that, and I never really did that. I've never, uh. like, had to hit anything with the hammer or do anything like Number one, I don't even know how. Number two, I had no desire to do it. I wouldn't be flipping houses if I had to do that stuff. And I wouldn't be on YouTube if I had to go sit in Premiere Pro and edit a video. Like, I just already, in everything I've ever done, I'm just like, nope, not doing it, but I will find somebody who will. See, I, I wish, because I'm like that too. You know, I believe in, in if you have somebody that's an expert in something, pay them to do it because they know they can do it much faster than you and I can way better, you know, but I don't know why my ignorance of me being, I guess, if you want to say handy, well, I can, I can learn from here. No, hundred percent. Handy people oh. are their own worst enemy. Yeah. The fact that you know how to fix cars is probably your worst enemy. Oh yeah. I dude, I couldn't even tell you where the oil is in a car. Seriously. <laughs> That's why I have a Tesla. Yeah. I don't know what to do with it. Yeah. No, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's true. It's like, you know, we just talked about this off camera. Like, you know, when, uh, I'll get a car, I'll have an issue. One of the, my texts will say, oh, it's, it's unfixable, I can't do it. Instead of me focusing on building my YouTube or doing some consulting or coaching, I'm like, move I'll out of the way, it. I'll get fix out of the it way. myself. You know, I'll spend the next three and a half hours of my <laughs> life playing with a $500 car that really is not going to make anything in the scheme of life. But yeah. it's just, and I'm trying to get away from that. Like I said, I I started doing the editing, the, the lighting, the, yeah. the cameras. And like I'm taking camera classes, you know, I'm going to, was that B&H, the camera studio here? Yeah with a, a bunch of senior citizens watching how to shoot birds so I can figure out how to shoot cars more productively, you know? And so this is some of the stuff I'm sure that people don't talk about. No, but I mean, 90% 90, <laughs> 90 of people who want to get into social media or do something are thinking about how can they do it themselves, right? Yeah. And look, I mean, I get it for a lot of people, especially if you don't have the money to hire somebody. Like, okay, you're going to have to probably, well, no, actually I'm not going to allow people that out. Yeah. You know, some people will say, oh, I can't afford them. Well, you can either do something you're good at 
to make more money to afford them instead of trying to learn a whole new skill set that you have no knowledge of and it's going to take you forever to learn it. Yeah, the time why not just the money. Yeah, double down on something you're good at so you can go hire the thing you don't have any clue about. But number two, there's ways to hire people without paying them. I mean, you can add value to somebody by teaching them your skill. You just got to find the right person who's willing to barter like that, you know? So I don't know. I always think about in everything I do, how do I, you know, well, okay. When there's a problem, it's always, all right, who's going to fix this? Cause it's not me. Like somebody else is going <laughs> to like, what, who do I need that yeah. can fix this problem? Cause I don't, I don't do this. Hey, you eliminated one major step. I'd probably <laughs> play with that problem for two, three hours and still wind up hiring somebody. Yeah. You're like, all right, I'm going to go it. watch YouTube, how to do this and figure it. I'm like, nope, like who <laughs> I'm going to whatever. And I'm going to find the guy to fix it. Yeah. But yeah, dude. Um, this has been an awesome chat with you, dude. I'm, I'm super hyped to have you on the podcast and we're definitely going to have to do it again. We're going to do the follow-ups to our YouTube series for sure. And, um, you know, tell the people where to find you. Um, you can find me on YouTube at automotive life. Also on Instagram at automotive dot life. And like I said, go to Ryan's channel, like our video, how to flip cars as well as visit mine. And I appreciate you having me on. Yeah, man. And if you guys aren't subscribed yet, make sure you go subscribe on Apple Podcasts to this channel uh, or to this podcast, I should say. And then um, go subscribe to the YouTube channel for this podcast so you can watch it on video. And uh, we'll catch you guys next episode. Take care. Thanks for watching the Ryan Pineda Show. If you want to work with me, head over to ryanpineda.com. You can find my courses, coaching programs, and upcoming events. We also have free resources you can download, so head over to ryanpineda.com.